All right. Hi, everybody. It's RCFB Talk 197. I am hoping that this show goes smoothly. Last week, we had kind of a weird hiccup where the uh, first 16 seconds kept looping on people. I'm not entirely sure what happened there. I tried to find it out. Couldn't get a good answer, but it looks like everything is working smoothly now. So uh, welcome. It's our Tuesday night show. This is when we take college football calls from all y'all on whatever topics you want to talk about in college football. It's the offseason, but there's always things to talk about. My name's Bob Ekayeri. I'm part of the team that runs RCFB. I also do another show for advanced publications called uh, The College Football Survivor Show with CBS's Shahan J. Raja. But this is all about you and whatever you want to talk about. So if you want to join the conversation, feel free to hit request. I can see a couple of people have already hit request, so I'm going to go ahead and let you guys up. Let's see here, Logan, and I'm also going to let up uh, our friend John. So, Logan, what's going on? Feel free to hit unmute. By the way, before I forget, I just want to say our condolences to the family of uh, Willie Mays. That was just, uh, I was sad to see that he has passed on a full life. Uh, he died at age 93 um, today. So I saw that news just like oh, about an hour ago. So sports legend. I mean, he played football back in the, like in high school, I think. But still, just a, a, a massive figure in sports. So I just wanted to say that. But, Logan, what's going on? Hey, everyone. Hey, I just wanted to kind of give a hot take on the year, kind of going into the year. I'm a big Arizona guy, um, but I just wanted to say I think Arizona is going to win the Big 12 this year, shock a lot of people. I think the defense has a lot of important pieces. You have Jacob Monner, you have Takario Davis, um, offensive line. On the offensive side of the ball, you have the offensive line. You have two potential NFL first-round draft picks on that line. Wendell Moe is the other guy. Um, probably won't be a draft pick for another year or so, but another potential first-rounder. Um, you have Jonas Savanea, Tetero McMillan, Noah Fafita. I, I think the Arizona Wildcats have really slept on this year. I think there's a lot of misconception about Jed Fish. I, and I, Jed did a great job, don't get me wrong. Um, but I think that there's one thing that was really overlooked in his tenure, and then I'll get off and let you guys kind of talk about it real quick um but it, a lot of people don't know jed didn't play the best quarterback on the roster two of his three seasons in his first year he started gunner cruz and will Plummer, who weren't very good um you had jordan mcleod who ended up at jmu who got injured that year towards acl taking the fourth game um after he finally got a start um and then Jaden delora in year yep. three was the starter for the first couple games was not really impressive um didn't really get much better it seems like and 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 there was a lot of questions on, is Jed making the right personal decisions? But, hey, I'll hop off and let you guys talk. No, I think that's uh, – I'm happy to start with Arizona. And I think you're right, you know, because obviously Noah Fafita came in midway and then Jalen Laura's whole life kind of went off the rails there. So, you know, Texas State tried to bring him in and then they they had a, to cancel that one because of, of what was going on with him off the field. But, um, you know, their schedule isn't too bad. I just want to say that about the Wildcats. And I think the fact that Brennan, who did – a good job at a terrible program because San Jose State is just a terrible program. It's hard to win there. Um, I've heard coaches tell me at Mountain West Media Days, like they're like, well, I, I, it's not quite how they said it, but the implication was, well, at least we're not San Jose State because it's just such a tough deal with how hard it is, um, with how expensive it is. And you're also running a G5 program where you can't pay people what they would even need to necessarily even live well <laughs> in, the, uh, in the San Jose and the Silicon Valley area. But putting that aside, um, his ability to retain Noah Fafita and uh, uh, T-Mac, uh, I think, was a great deal because that's going to keep that offense moving. And that defense will be really interesting. I agree. You know, their non-conference isn't terrible. They have that kind of like a few of these new additions to the Big 12. They have a, a non-conference conference game with K-State. That'll be a tough one. That's actually – the other one is actually Baylor-Utah. Those are two – technically they're being counted as non-conference because of just the, the fact that they were already on the schedule and now they're actually in the same conference. Um, they go to Utah. That'll be a tough one, although they do have a bye before that game. And they do go to UCF. So those will be kind of odd games, I think, in that conference schedule. But yeah, Arizona, it'll be interesting. I'm very curious to see where they could go. They could very well return to the Alamo Bowl, except on the other side, you know, because um, obviously last season they went there as a part of the Pac-12, and now this time they could be the Big 12 rep. Although I believe the way it's set up, the Alamo Bowl for a couple of years as part of their settlement is they can still pick most former Pac-12 teams, although they tried to also add Texas and Oklahoma to it, and uh, that was not agreed to. Um, that one did not work out for them. But yeah, the Wildcats, you know, bear down. It'll be interesting. To hey, uh, I, I just, hey, Jackson, what's quickly, going on? Quickly, uh, Logan, pack your, pack your back your San Antonio, Logan. Uh, go Utes. The Wildcats are going to Alamo Bowl. 
Uh, thank you guys. The Utes so much. are absolutely fascinating this season. You know, I, I, it's really there are a couple of teams out there. Uh, Kansas is one, but I think where we're relying on what we're we're not relying on. I mean, that that totally undercuts what Kyle Winningham's done, and this is going to be his twenty season, which is just bonkers to think about. But uh, the defense, no one's going to question that. I think Cam Rising, uh, the the success of the Utes is going to be on Cam Rising. I think they could still, and, and that's where I have my questions. Sorry, no, to not at all. Quick. I, that's that's where I think with with Utah, I, I think they're going to be fantastic. I think they're going to be right there in the thick of things in the Big 12. My thing with them is we don't know what Cam Rising looks like. I know that there's a lot of people in the Utah media and whatnot saying, you know, that kind of giving the assumption that he's going to be the same. And that's where he had a very serious knee injury. Um, Tore, I think, four or five different things. Very similar to a Teddy Bridgewater, I think, situation. Obviously, he didn't lose his leg but um, or close to it. But but I, I think that's the thing that's going to come down to is what does Cam Rising look like? And, and quite, quite frankly, none of us really know what that looks like yet. But I, I think the Utes are going to be fantastic. I think they're right there and going to be a college football playoff contender. Um, but but that's what's going to come down to. And if, if Rising is what he was before he got hurt, man, they're, they're going to be a top three team in the country, in my opinion, honestly. They're going to be really, really good. Especially you had Dorian Singer and some of those other pieces. I think keep these back. You're, you're going to have a really, really good team that's – Underrated in my mind. Yeah, they they've got a and their schedule isn't awful. Again, they have that Baylor non conference game. Um, again, because of the, the the just the quirk of joining the conference so quickly. Um, obviously the Battle of the Brothers that's always fun because it's a good rivalry game. And then yeah, at Oklahoma State that'll probably be the one I'm circling as the toughest on their schedule right now because the one thing and this is the wonderful thing if you're an Arizona fan, if you're a Utah fan, if you're a fan of any any team right now. Actually, it's so funny on the. Uh, on that show I do uh, for advanced uh, publications with Sean, we just broke down the G5. And, and even we could say, like, all of these teams are theoretically now, one of them will certainly be in the playoff because of the way the 12-team playoff is structured. But for those in the P4, I mean, you can drop a game or two and still be in, especially if you win your conference. Because if you win your conference, and obviously the way it's structured now with the 12 teams, it's the 5 plus 7 model, the 5 top conference finishers and then seven at large teams but if you win the big 12 if you win the acc you're going to be in the playoff there, there's no doubt i mean it, you could limp into that conference title game although again now there's no divisions in any of these leagues so it's going to be the top two teams you're not going to have a big 10 west team that's miserable suddenly up somehow miraculously upset you know in ohio state and get in but at the same time there is a chance to be the best of a team uh, of a conference that's beat itself up and still get in there now the worst case scenario there would be that you don't that the g5 champ is so good that they rank higher than the lowest p4 champ in the uh the final rankings in which like a cincinnati style of year because cincinnati pulled that off if you want to think about it then all that means is you don't get a first round buy. So it wouldn't mean that the Big 12 or ACC wouldn't be in it. It just means that they wouldn't be necessarily, they would be probably rank number five or six or something like that. So it's, uh, or seeded, I should say. I should use the word seeding. It's so, we're, we're, we're college football fans. I always want to say rank, but seeding. Um, but this is going to be fascinating stuff. So I think that's the wonderful thing. No matter what team you're a fan of, the chances to get into the playoff is better than ever. Um, and there's a lot to be excited for. Uh, John, what's going on? You've been patient. Hey, man. How you doing tonight? Good. It looks like we don't have a technical hiccup because for those who weren't here last week, again, we were told via like replies to this space and a couple of people like we realized it was I was getting people who were messaging me on my phone and I was seeing it like because I have to use my phone to do this. I was seeing the messages pop up and like I, I can only hear like the first five seconds. I'm literally seeing you introduce the show and then it just repeat so i don't know what happened but the funny thing was if you were a speaker it was literally me john and like two other people and all we could hear each other and no one else could hear us so it was and then at the the real thing that was the kicker when the show ended twitter said or x said there was an hour and 30 seconds recorded and none of it recorded it was just the 16 seconds so that was a lost show um <laughs> but it was a fun conversation. But John, how are you doing? Not bad, you know. I, just, I feel honored to be part of that historical moment on uh, on CSP Talk. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, um, I want to talk about tonight about uh, con uh, conference sponsorships. And, you know, that news yes. came out late last week where the Big Twelve was uh, considering sell selling their naming rights, Conference USA as well too. 
And I, I, I want to f- try to figure out what is going to be the most realistic path. Because, right? I mean, I, they're going to do it. I, I, don't, I don't think – I'm not doubting they won't do it at this point. But are they going to go, like, Big 12 sponsored by Allstate? Are they going to be called the Allstate Conference? It's going to be Big Allstate. I, I'll tell you what. If I have to call something by its corporate name, like the Allstate Conference – I think I would rather watch Iowa play offense for four hours straight than have to call something the All State <laughs> Conference. That is that destroys my soul. It, 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 it's such a quirky thing, you know. Um, the the thing I've heard is again like the two that were announced or not announced that were just thrown out there. Like these are conversations happening because I know Brett McMurphy got the Conference USA that Globe Life apparently was interested in calling it, you know, Globe Life Conference USA or the Globe Life. <laughs> Boy, that'll be a fun one. Globe Life Conference. Uh, and then, yeah, Allstate was interested in the Big 12. Apparently, they were thinking about calling it the Allstate 12 is what I last heard. And that was from Ross Dellinger because the 12, they believe, is more important, even though the numbers have long since gone the way of ir- like completely non-descriptive ever since the Big 10 added Penn State and became 11. Um, but, yeah, no, it's... Uh, it seems like they're coming and it sounds like they they're not necessarily and who knows there's negotiation that could happen here and maybe the conference presidents will say no but it sounds like they wanted to be the all state 12 not the all state big 12 because historically the media doesn't like to use the corporate name they just kind of skip it you know it becomes like not the uh, all state sugar bowl it's the sugar bowl you know not the uh, that's why some of the bowls just straight up started xing out the old name like the uh, the Gator Bowl, or for you, the others, like they don't actually say that word anymore. They just use a corporate title um, to kind of force that fact. And, you know, at the same time, I remember, gosh, I grew up in the, you know, especially in the 80s. So I remember the Lakers of the 80s. And I remember everyone before Staples Center was built. And again, isn't that funny? We're literally, everyone knows that the Staples Center, now it's crypto.com arena, whatever. But, you know, Staples was, a, it's like a, it's a um, office supply store chain, especially in the West Coast. So, the, their previous spot was a great Western forum. And I always thought that was a great name. You know, it's called the forum, you know, it's right by, you know, been there forever. And then I realized great Western was a financial company. So, whoa, you know, <laughs> this thing I grew up with, I just knew it as a great Western forum because it sounded so perfect for the place like the Lakers played in on the West coast it was actually a, a corporate sponsor name. So we'll see where it goes. I don't think the sec or big 10 would necessarily be interested um, or if they did, they might have a little more negotiating power. I think the problem, or I don't know if they call it a problem, but the the Big 12, it's a newer name because obviously it was made up of the Big 8, what was the left of the Big 8 combining with some of the old Southwest Conference teams. Maybe they think there's not as much of a connection there. I'm not sure. Um, some of these others would be, I, the ACC would be a funny one because it isn't even the Atlantic Coast anymore now that they have Stan, Cal and Stanford um, to say nothing of SMU. So Maybe they should be open to naming themselves something else. I'm not sure. But uh, it's an interesting arms race thing because you have the Big Ten and uh, SEC going to be bringing in all this money. We now know with the settlement, which, again, fully expected, there will be some form of compensation now, not only with the the damages. The damages are fixed. Those will be done. But moving forward, you're going to have to figure out how to share revenue with the students. Um, with the, the players, uh, you know, and that might be a, a way to, to kind of generate revenue, especially for the Big Ten, pardon me, the Big 12, pardon me, and the, uh, th- that's all we need. We just need to call it the All-State Conference. That'll be easier. I won't confuse them with the Big Ten and the, the All-State Conference, right? But, uh, you know, with the uh, the Big 12 and the ACC to kind of make up that gap. But we'll see. Uh, I mean, I'm curious to see. It's fun to also imagine, um, particularly with, uh, apparently the other G5s are very interested in this. I mean, the MAC is the oldest, con- I think the MAC is technically the oldest conference or close to the oldest conference. They would be a weird one, but, you know, Sun Belt. I mean, could it be something interesting? I'm not sure, you know. Um, I, I would have some fun with this. I mean, with the SEC and Big Ten, there could be a ton of money in there because they would be almost like, you'd hear some just, billion 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 dollar companies step in you know like barclays premier league is one you always hear about it's no longer called that but you know could they go in that direction um would it be like i don't know the the walmart sec would be pretty spectacular though um the target big 10 oh that would be too perfect oh my gosh but i'm not sure where that would go i I would say i'd love to see bucky somewhere in there i think bucky's is really needs to jump in while the iron's hot they could probably afford Conference USA. I think or, they or, could. Somebody or, pointed or, out the Mountain Dew West would be also ooh. perfect. Like that one, that one just sort of sort of fits, but <laughs> or just something after dark. Like just have a casino company just straight up sponsor them. 
Um, and we can maybe even get to that later. The whole idea of, you know, obviously the, I, they're, they're getting permission to add the patches to the jerseys and potentially um, uh, field logos as well. But let me see here. Dr. Pepper Bucko, what's going on, man? Our friend from Pitt. What's up? Just uh, another another day. And uh, um, so I just, not too long ago, I saw uh, North Texas is a uh, rebrand on uh, the jerseys. It's the same thing as Iowa and uh, what am I thinking? Baylor. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to see that in New Jersey. Um, I do wonder how they're going to do this season, though. North Texas is an interesting one, only because I remember when I was trying to sort out what to make of the American and which teams might kind of surprise. They were actually the team I had one of the hardest times with because they're the obvious contenders. In the American Conference, you have UTSA, um, Memphis, and, you know, but at the same time, like, where do you, I mean, even USF, some people have called USF, like, they might be one of the ones. I'm a little bit, a little more hesitant on that one. Um, but, yeah, that's been a big question, like, where will we, where will North Texas fit into this? Because I, I have some, I, I think they have some good things going there. I mean, obviously, uh Gosh, his name just slipped my mind. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Eric Morris, good coach, second season there. And, and Chandler Morris, if he can work for them, that'll be a big hit. I mean, Chandler Morris from Oklahoma via uh, TCU. Um, but I'm interested to see where that's going to go. Um, but, yeah, no, I haven't had a chance to see that jersey. I should I should take a look at that. If, if anyone gets a chance, feel free to just drop it into the replies. Just look at Baylor. It's the same thing. <laughs> It's the same thing. <laughs> they should really lean into more. They, I wish there were more creativity. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll see. Maybe they'll get a sponsor on that jersey. Maybe they'll be the Bucky's, the Bucky's logo. That would actually look great. Whoever gets the Bucky's logo on their jersey, that's going to be, I think a lot of people who are neutral fans might actually want to buy the jersey. So maybe that's another way to get some some extra funding on top of that. I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, John, I see your hand up, and then we'll go to Yeah, Cody. well, speaking of uh, jersey redesigns, that uh, were you aware of the TCU taking pretty much blending down their jerseys a couple of days ago? No, they, they took, that's they a took shame. away the entire like that cool collar design. They took it completely off. They went plain jerseys. Now it's their new announcement for jerseys. It is it's one of the worst downgrades of a. In my opinion, it was one of the top five jerseys in college football. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, it, yeah, it's very. They've gone with just kind of straight. Uh, straight colors on the white, the purple, and the black versions of it. None of that that kind of frog collar, yeah. the Kermit the Frog collar, however you want yeah, to it's, call it's it, such, that they had going there for a, a while. Shame. I know a lot of colleges have been doing it, going with a more bold design of just you know a single color, which you know that's cool. But I feel this, I feel this is a this this that's such a bad that's such a bad move. I'm sorry. I mean the TCU. I mean that's such a recognizable jersey to anyone, even who's more of a casual football fan, in my opinion. It's just I don't know. I just I feel like they you know they got to reconsider. Yeah, I hope they go. I hope they at least have one variant with the the blood frog one because for those who are unaware, um, the uh, the horn frog is actually a lizard that can, in if it wants to defend itself, constrict its eye vessels and squirt blood at people. So they've had a couple of times with red accents, and that's a, a reference to it on that particular jersey. But Cody, you've been patient. What's on your mind? Uh, happy uh, Tuesday, everybody. Um... Just wanted to talk a little USC. Obviously, I'm a little biased. I'm a Trojan fan. Um, just kind of, it looks like they're getting some unnecessary heat today. Uh, it looks like everyone's calling. They're the reason why the old Miss USC home and home got called off. Um, but everything I've read is mutual. And honestly, I don't, I, as much as I hate it, because I wanted to go to Oxford to watch the Trojans play, I don't, I don't blame them. I, I just think with the Big Ten and SEC, like, there's no reason to add to your schedule. Make it harder than it already is. It sucks for us fans. Like, I'm going to Vegas this year to watch them play LSU, and I'm excited. But I get it. Like, I get it. And I think it's an unfortunate part of the sport because I love watching these weird out-of-conference out matchups. Um, just want to kind of hear your thoughts on all of it. Yeah, I heard that too. And um, uh, it's interesting because also – Earlier in the month, we were hearing rumors that USC had been trying to get out of that LSU game as well. And and let me be clear, I, I am a Trojan. In fact, I think some of the shots you can sometimes see, I've got that old helmet on the top of my <laughs> on the top of my work desk. I've had that desk forever. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it um 
it's it's awkward and and I agree it seems to be a product of the the playoff structure I don't know I it could also be you know it could very well be part of coach Lincoln Riley's philosophy I'm not sure um the fact is though as I said before you can get away with a loss now or a loss or two as long as they're quality losses and still end up in the in the playoff I mean either by nature of winning your conference or by which will, if you're a P4 team will absolutely get you in uh, or um, just strength of schedule. So if, like if you, if you lose an off conference, a non-conference game like Georgia, your team, your team isn't sunk if it keeps winning, you know, um, there are some G5 programs. In fact, when we were kind of breaking down potential playoff contenders uh, that could make it in Boise state was an interesting one. Because, yeah, they go and play at Oregon. You can just pencil that in as a loss. But the rest of their schedule isn't bad. So if you lose in not horrific fashion to Oregon and you're Boise State and you win the Mountain West, you probably have a good shot of being the, the G5, you know, the, the one, the, the, probably the 12 seed going into it. So all of that said, if a USC or an, or an Ole Miss, let's be honest, Ole Miss is great now. Uh, you know, they're, they're certainly a playoff contender. Like by, I, no one is called, not calling them a playoff contender at this, especially in the 12 team playoff. Um, it, the joke is, you know, the 12 team playoff is designed for two teams, Penn State and Ole Miss. But um, either of those teams, if they played, if they lost that game, it wouldn't kill their season. Like they would still have a shot to make it in. Um, so that's, that's the other flip side of it. Now, of course, we're telling you, I can't, you can't compare it to Boise State. The the conference schedule in the Big Ten and the SEC is much more difficult week after week. That goes without saying. Um, and USC this season will be interesting. I'm actually hoping to cover the LSU game um, in Vegas. That'll be fun. It's in Allegiant. I mean, that's an exciting game. That That is by far the marquee game, one of the marquee games of the I mean, it's a great opening weekend, but that's a Sunday game that I think is going to get a lot of attention because you have two teams – that both of them had terrible defenses last season. Both of them had Heisman quarterbacks, although obviously LSU got more out of their Heisman quarterback last season while USC just had Caleb Williams desperately trying to get anything going for that particular offense. So it'll be an interesting kind of benchmark game for both of those programs. Um, not quite the panic button mode that Florida and Miami will have where both of them, whoever loses that school, that game is going to be in a complete conniption fit. Um, USC is going to be interesting this season just in general, by the way. I mean, you know, Danton Lynn, that was such a hire from UCLA. That was such a hire from me. I remember watching UCLA over the season before they even played. And I thought, man, I even told a USC friend, I'm like, wouldn't it be wild if we just hired him? And then it happened. Um, so, you know, and then obviously they've got uh, Eric Henderson from the Rams. Um, they returned some good talent. Miller Moss, uh, Zachariah Branch, Bear Alexander, who was like, kind of looked at the portal and got reported that he was going in and then stayed. I guess they secured the bag on that one. Um, but at the same time, you know, Jay, Jay Mayava from uh, UNLV is a good person to have on that roster as well. Probably a good quarterback, if not a quarterback of the future. If not now, we'll see. Um, but that schedule is interesting, too. I mean, they're playing at Michigan, Wisconsin and Penn State at home, at Washington. And, of course, the Notre Dame game is going to be a heck of a season for USC. But, yeah, going back, though, to the USC Ole Miss thing, it was disappointing. I thought, like you, that that would have been a good game. I get why. I think we're the problem is too the twelve team playoff just got here, so no one's actually sure how it works out when you get to the end of the season and the college football committee is picking those twelve teams. Like, yeah, five of them are going to be locked in because they're conference champs. But what if you're one of those at larges? How are they actually going to weigh people? Um, you don't want to find out you're the 13th team. Now, you're not going to get a lot of public sympathy like Florida State obviously did this last cycle, but it would certainly be, uh, you know, for your fan base, it's going to be crushing if you're that team and you wonder like, well, what, what could we have done a little different to maybe be the 11th team? We're going to skip 12 because we're going to assume that it's a G5 team in most years. But what could you have done to make that jump. I'm not sure. Cody, your hand's still up. So what do you think? Yeah. Um, just going back to what you're saying, um, going, kind of track, going back to the USC LSU game. Um, I'm just, I want to talk about that for a second because I'll be there and I'm sure. so excited for that game. Um, I, I think that game, I don't know if people really talking about it much, but I think it's monstrous for both teams. I think it's really going to set the tone for either team. Like if they're going to make the playoff that year, this year based off that game. I know it sounds maybe a little over dramatic, but you really, these are two, uh, I mean, 
I use it lightly, powerhouses going at it, I think it's going to set the tone for either team the rest of the season. Maybe I'm overreacting on that, but maybe you can let me know. No, I think you're, I think it will set the tone for both programs. Of the two, I think LSU needs it a little more because LSU really does want to just say, like, look, we adjusted our defense. Yeah, we don't have the same quarterback, but, you know, uh, it's, I believe, Nussmeyer who they're, they're throwing in there. Like, we have the talent. We will make this work. Like, you know, Brian Kelly, year three, this is it. You know, here we go. Um, where USC, I think, honestly disappointed so much last season that people are just hoping to see the defense is competent and they've got a, you know, just like then they also have a new quarterback, but for some reason it just feels that Lincoln Riley is being given a little more room to show improvement than Brian Kelly. And I think perhaps it's because more recently LSU has been great. Uh, you know, obviously it's not, it was right before I, the 2020 national championship game, I was in the Superdome. Like we saw them win the title and that was just a, such a fantastic moment for LSU fans. So that's more fresh in the memory. And I think perhaps that's get, putting that extra level of pressure on them. And again, I'm not saying that either team, again, whoever loses that game is still certainly going to be in the race, even if one of the teams just gets blown out. I mean, with the way this playoff works, you could still be in the race. You know, you could still conceivably get there. Um, but at the same time, I think LSU is a little more. I think we're going to see the hype train for this game really build up coming up to it. There's so many things going on that first weekend. That I mean, it's awesome, isn't it? I mean, I'm hoping to cover two games that week. I'm hoping to cover the opener for Minnesota because I live in Minnesota. I was hoping that I'm going to be in the press box for North Carolina, Minnesota. Not like a huge stakes game, but, you know, hell, I, if it's a good game. I'm going to go hopefully cover that one. But then I want to go to L.A. and then probably to Las Vegas and cover that one. Those It's a weekend full of games. So it'll definitely get its hype, but it's got to wait for somebody else to go ahead of it because it's a good week. It is absolutely – that week one is delightful. But, yeah, so, um, you know, just wanted to touch on a couple of other little just quick stories, odds and ends that are kind of in here. And, again, if you'd like to join the conversation, please, by all means, hit request. Uh, let you up here. We'll talk about whatever you want to talk about in college football, even though – it's the off season. There's always stuff to talk about. This is June. So like some of the wilder takes are coming out of some of the sports writers. I've noticed um, that's just the, the nature of the season. Um, there was kind of a, a good moment here where I guess it was mascot day. And some of you may have seen this. Georgia tweeted out their two mascots, their live mascot and their costume mascot. Positioning on the photo was a little weird. It looks like, um, you know, the costume mascot is posing behind Aga the dog, but also kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little suggestive. So uh, somebody suggested, did Georgia Tech hack? Because uh, that's a very Georgia Tech thing to do. Did Georgia Tech hack their rival's Twitter account? And they just quote tweeted and said, we didn't even have to. Um, that Georgia Tech account's been having a little bit of fun. They also teased. The fact that the uh, the new NCAA game is going to have the victory formation. <laughs> and so they said, can you imagine not ever using it? Uh, again, for those who, who may not have been around, that was the Miami game. Uh, that was a, a clear reference to that. Um, someone else has pointed out, and also, again, I don't write every tweet for this account, but I was, about this time last year, the reports were coming out that San Diego State was going to the Pac-12. My goodness, how has the last year changed for them? I mean, can you imagine you are about to finally join? For those of you who don't remember how that went, they actually told the Mountain West, like, hey, so um, we're thinking of leaving, but we're not officially leaving yet. And the big the, the commissioner of the Mountain West said, we're taking this letter as proof that you're leaving. And now we're going to start the process of basically kicking you out. And needless to say, it kind of all quietly went away after the Pac-12 went away. Um, so... But my goodness, that has that is a conference that has a team. Pardon me, for those who you, you have to be a little older and you have to remember some of the real weird conference shuffles from about oh a dozen years ago. They were for like a hot second members of the Big East or future members of the Big East because TCU and San Diego State were going to try and shore up what was the Big East, which eventually evolved into the American Conference, and then that fell apart. Um, because all those teams that had been in the Big East left, like uh, West Virginia uh, went and joined the, the Big 12, like that kind of a, a hemorrhaging of teams. So they awkwardly wanted to come back to the Mountain West, and the, apparently the rest of the conference teams didn't want them back except for Boise State. Boise State, and Ma I swear, Boise State and San Diego State have to still be quietly friends because Boise State basically said, no, no, we're letting them back in. 
Um, and and they did. So uh, without any real hiccups there. But looks like we have someone else who wants to join the conversation. Um, let's see here. Sam, uh, let's see. Sam Houston Sports Talk. Uh, Sam Houston Sports Talk, whenever you get a chance, feel free to unmute. Um, one other kind of what really quick kind of thing that came across the, the news in the past week. Again, we, we do these weekly. Uh, UCLA has named their new president as Julio Frank, the president of Miami, University of Miami. He's going to be their new chancellor in January of next year. And the con- not a huge story. I mean, you know, this happens. You know, university presidents and chancellors, it's a, it's a good gig. And usually these top universities hire from other top universities. Um, but the comment that I love, and this is a, a Papa Lou, I guess he's a UCF fan, but he said, uh, Miami fans were saying, Frank, let's go to the Big Ten, please. And, and Frank was like, I'm on my way. So he's now he's now a Big Ten uh, chancellor, or he's going to be. But anywho, uh, Sam Houston Sports Talk, what's on your mind? Feel free to unmute whenever you get a chance it's in the bottom left. Yeah, there you go. I, 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 the internet was playing uh, games with me, but uh, <laughs> oh, I, I hear you. Let me trust. Trust me. You never know with this. Sometimes uh, I can't even hear the guest, and everyone, all the other guests, can hear them, and I look like the idiot who's just sort of sitting there, like you can unmute, <laughs> you know. So don't worry about it. Oh uh, no, uh, no. I was just, I, I just wanted to pop a quick question to you. You know, I, I know we're a little over seventy days away from kickoff to the season, but I, I was just curious. What, what, what did, what do you think? As of right now, as we are now 74 days away, for us, at least for the Bearcats, from kickoff, we begin the season against Rice at Houston. I was curious what you think that the Bearcats could potentially <laughs> potentially do. And sorry, that was the dog. but uh, Don't worry but about it. What could the Bearcats Yeah, the Bearcats do? were such a, a strange team last season because of all the, how that defense seemed to be playing their hearts out. And there was like no offense to go with it. So that's going to be obviously a big question on that. I mean, Casey Keeler is a good coach. Um, I thought he was he was up for jobs before I think Sam Houston decided to move up. And then he decided to stick with the ship on that one. So that's a good thing. Rice is an oddball. Um, I didn't think about them until, um, again, I do a, a kind of a formal podcast where I'm actually hired by a newspaper group. But my cohort, um, John J. Roger, he's a CBS sports writer. He pointed out Rice actually is looking fairly good this season because we're so used to just discounting Rice. They're not a great team. They're just kind of, you know, blah, 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 all these problems. Well, last season, they were able to work their way into a bowl. This season, they keep enough of that team, um, and they have some interesting kind of points coming into it where they're going to be a bigger threat than they normally would. Now, all of that said, it's still Rice. Who knows? Um, so Sam Houston certainly has a shot there. Um they have some reasonable opponents, you know, when getting Hawaii as a non-conference opponent, isn't that bad, especially since you're making Hawaii come to you when they leave the mainland, it's a totally different team. And, and again, it's still kind of trying to find their way. I think under Timmy Chang, um, as far as conference USA, obviously Liberty is the favorite odds on, um, keeping, uh, Caden Salter was huge. And, uh, what we've seen, from Jamie Chadwell, again, the coach who was shocked to see that that was the team that finally offered him because he was ta- so talented. It seemed like a lot of teams would have wanted him. Um, but at the same time, uh, what it was interesting, too, because the other team to worry about is going to be the team that that elevated with Sam Houston, and that's, of course, Jacksonville State, because uh, Rich Rod has him going in an interesting direction. Um, I think... It was interesting, both of us, when we were kind of doing our analysis of G5 conferences, we thought the two team, the team that had the biggest shot, and again, we could be 100% wrong on this. I don't want to be, I'm not trying to say we're the be-all, end-all on this, but the team that we thought had the best chance was uh, the, the, the Gamecocks of Jacksonville State because, against Logan Smothers, is, is, I believe he's taking over for Zion Webb. They have two good running backs with Anwar Lewis and Ron Wiggins and a good defense, and they've got two of their DEs back now. Western Kentucky could be another one that we were thinking of. Sam, he, again, the, the real oddball in all of Conference USA, I thought was Middle Tennessee, because only because they brought in Derek Mason. Now, I know he didn't do great at Vandy, but he can get a good defense going. And I'm not saying Middle Tennessee is going to win Conference USA. I really don't think that. But I think they're going to be the oddball spoiler team. That's another one where... Um, Actually, fortunately, you guys missed them. I'm sorry. I didn't notice that. But And you guys get the new guys, Kansas State. That'll be a fun one. I, 
the, I think the problem is, and I apologize for being so circular on this. I just kind of went into talking about Conference USA with Sam Houston. They are hard to peg right now, um, only because of how weird last year is. What do you guys? What, you're you have a closer eye and a closer ear to what's going on in that program. What changes should we expect heading into the next season? Will we see? More, I mean, is are they returning at least starters on that offense? Are we going to see more experience, or so, uh, or should we be concerned? So, so Sam Houston's going to bring back Ife Day, and Ife is not well known for catching that game-winning touchdown in the FCS championship back in 2021 against South Dakota State. Uh, he uh, had a very he had a leg injury against U of H uh, that set him out for the rest of the year, and he comes back this year, um, brought in some. Brought in Michael Phoenix, the second from Kilgore College. He's he was one of the best JUCO wide receivers, especially in the state of Texas. And then we just got uh, Jace Bauer from Sh- Central Michigan. Uh, Keegan Shoemaker graduated, so right now it's been a QB kind of a, a bit of a QB competition. But I, I'm fully expecting Jace Bauer, like I said, transfer from Central Michigan to be the starting uh, quarterback. Then we got Jay Ducker, uh, transfer running back from. Memphis, uh, he, not really sure who's going to be the number one running back as well on that front. So there's going to be some competition there. We're returning a lot of our O-linemen, and we picked up some good transfers when it comes to the defensive side of things. And and I think what's going to be interesting is especially going to be that defense because Sam Houston just hired Skylar Cassidy, who was at Abilene Christian, and he is the youngest defensive coordinator in the in FBS now at just 29 years old. That's remarkable. And I just remember that you guys have actually renewing the rivalry with Texas State. Oh, yeah. That's going to be awesome. That's an NRG. Oh, yeah. That's going to be mm. – NRG is a fun stadium. I got. I had a chance to finally to visit it um, this last January for the title game. And, uh, yeah, it's a good venue. Um, I I see we have a couple – I see Luke Scott. I'm only going to mention you because I noticed I think you're also a Sam Houston person. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Colin, they're on Sports Talk. We, we run that together. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, no, our, our big issue last year is that we were unable uh, throwing the ball. We, we couldn't throw the ball more than five yards down the field. So with the new quarterback coming in uh, that looked halfway decent in the MAC, and the MAC is an all right conference, uh, I think we'll be much better. I think I think a bowl game here is, is definitely in play. Um, and I like the defensive coordinator hire just because I, I see all across football, NFL, college, high school, when you get young and you get aggressive, that really works. Uh, it's risky, but it's it's worked, uh, you know, really well in a lot of programs. And I just like kind of the direction we're going there. My issue is the O line. I mean, we just can't stop anybody. How many returners are there? I mean, at least you're going to get some experience on the line, or is it all new? Colin, I think it's three, isn't it? Uh, yeah, we return our center. We return our left tackle, who was on the uh, freshman All Conference USA team first team and or freshman team excuse me and we picked up we did we picked up some transfers uh as well uh we picked up an abilene christian transfer and a couple of others there's still a lot to be determined though so we at least return our center ethan Hagler, who's been you know he's been getting draft stock apparently as of late which uh i didn't know about until recently so maybe something to keep an eye on i think i mean luke luke and i are pretty much on the same page when it comes to the alignment that's going to be a the most underrated part of the Sparecat team that has to be, that's going to have to perform in order for us to be successful because a bowl game is certainly what we want to see out of the Bearcats, Bearcats, especially after going three and nine and losing the first eight games of the season. Do they, do they qualify for a bowl yet this season? Yeah, we do. Okay. The issue last year was that we lost like four overtime games. Yeah, I actually remember that season because they were kind of my weekly kind of comment like, man, they are just the hardest luck team right now because it's not like they're having their transition isn't awful. Uh, but my gosh, like every like every scoreline that would come out, you're like, what is happening over there? Like they're doing well with the defense, but they just can't seem to quite just quite get it. Yeah, over. The, the, the good thing about that is, though, is that, we you know, we see it all across football is that those one loss game, that, those one possession games turn the next year. Especially with, with exactly, I 100% agree. That's what you want to see in a new team, like, or I should say, a team that's moved up. That, like, okay, that means they're just they're just outside of it. Let's see that. It's the same reason, like, with a, a team like the hope with Matt Murrell's Nebraska team. It's like, yeah, they lost a couple of 
close games, but they were re- looking really good. And with Rule, you know, typically from history at Temple and and, and uh, at Baylor, that the teams get better as they go along. So I'm like, all right, that's a good place to start. So and obviously Keeler again, yeah, he's won a championship, so he can do it, and uh, and he can build a team. So again, I think it's just. Is this team where they're going to be? And and the bowl would be tremendous. The schedule is not all that awful. Again, the weird one was that Temple's actually pretty could be good yeah. this year. Um, UCF actually could also be good this year. I mean, they have it, it, they're building something there. I, I have to say, like again, my uh, my friend uh, who was here last week, Andrew, he he's a big UCF guy, but Gus Malzahn's building a team there. So again, two teams that historically aren't as strong um, actually might be pretty strong. Um, not that UCF wasn't strong, but again, like joining the big 12 and everything, but Hawaii that's reasonable. And the rest of conference USA is still conference USA. That rivalry game though with Texas state. Oh my goodness. That's going to be something else. They're good. They're yeah. They, good. They've gotten a lot better. I, I mean, I'm from, I mean, I'm from the area. I know San Marcos really well. I got a bunch of friends that went there. Um, uh, I got a question though about Kennesaw state. Um, and then I'll get out of here. Do you think this triple option that they're on that flex, is it going to work? Um, like you saw in the military cabinets for a long time, you you think how long will that adjustment take? I mean, it, option teams are just quirky. They're they're you, you sometimes they work. I mean, Georgia Tech kind of got its work. You know, obviously Paul Johnson, who was obviously a uh, an FCS guy with Georgia Southern before he went to Navy, and then obviously went to uh, uh, obviously went to to Georgia Tech. It can work at times, but whether I think. I think it could work in Conference USA, um, and the reason I say this, usually you'll see a team like that that can you know do well against G5 programs and some of the weaker P4, but then when you get to the sheer talent level you get at the very, very top of the P5, that's when that starts to, I think, counter it a bit more. Um, you know, like when Army will have a good season, then you'll see them play like Oklahoma and just, <laughs> you know, or it was actually LSU, Oklahoma last year, wasn't it? That was the one game where suddenly LSU's defense just seemed to work. Um, I think they shut them out, as I recall. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it's uh, it's 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 hard to tell. Um, we'll see how they do. Uh, I know, I believe UTSA gets to welcome them to the uh, to FBS next season. I think that's their opener, as I'm recalling. So I'm looking at that right now. Yeah, it is. It's a tough open. That's a really tough open. <laughs> that is a tough open. That is a really tough open. Yeah. They... All right. <laughs> hey, John, your hand's been up. I apologize. I wanted to let you get a chance to tie try. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of same Houston, I actually was also very familiar with their woes last season because I lost five straight weeks on betting on them. Um, not a fun time. Why I was betting on same Houston on Tuesday nights. That's not as y'all's business. But uh, <laughs> I, I can say I definitely, I definitely feel for you same Houston fans out there. Cause that that was rough to uh, rough to watch. Um, speaking of option teams, I just want to say uh, I, I think the option, like you said, is a quirky, fun offense to watch. I think why teams like Georgia Tech did well though is because Georgia Tech also had a future Hall of Famer at some points or first round pick at receiver that was always a threat. <laughs> so I, I think that's always a, something you need too. You know, you we need a a threat at receiver so that when you you can get caught a little bit on the back end. But uh, I think to make the option work, but that's just that's just my opinion because I think when those those years where they didn't have uh, you know a Calvin Johnson or Demarius Thomas, I, that team struggled. Yeah, and and to be honest, I think another thing that kind of hurt the option was just the, the ability, the, the fact that they changed some of the rules on blocking that really kind of was to the advantage of some of those option teams. Um, and again, it, it's harder to run. It's harder to run. It'll be interesting to see how they do it. It's and the problem is if you decide to change out of it, it is a, a bit of a recruiting headache for a little while. You have to be patient for a while there. Although who knows with the portal, maybe just <laughs> pull push everyone out. Apparently, you can do that too. So who knows? Uh, we'll see where that that goes. One other um, kind of as we kind of just hit on a couple of other stories. I know we talked a little bit about that, but uh, yeah. So conference renaming is on the table. It sounds like the G five programs are open for it. Oh, the G five. I should say conferences. So. Uh, apparently, Conference USA was was flirting, as we said earlier, with Globe Life, um, and I'm not a fan of that only because it's hard to say Globe Life Conference or Globe Life Conference USA um, or maybe Global USA, just to really make it a very weird name, Globe USA. Um, I hope there's other conferences, other team names out there 
that might come into play. I mean, maybe we'll get uh, Live USA or something like that. The Saudi, Aram, Saudi Aramco USA. That would be, let, let's get that one out there. There's enough teams in Texas to make that really painful. Um, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, I'll take a Jack yeah, Daniels. Yeah, so again, uh, it, I'll take a Jack Daniels Conference USA. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that would be awesome. Can you imagine? You know, like, or Coors. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, the Budweiser conference. Does the Pack 2 get sponsored by a meme coin at this point? Like, is Dogecoin going to sponsor <laughs> the Pack 12 <laughs> or the Pack 2? <laughs> my favorite rumor was that, and John Canzano put this out there, that the Pack 12 is eyeing Las Vegas for a football quote meetup. Because there's two teams. Like, what? what are we gonna have a media day there? Like, what? Just have a conference call, man. Like, don't even. This could have been an email. This is like the, this could have been an email. Um, it's so funny. I'm not gonna. Well, I'm not gonna name names, but I, I will name the conference because I got talking to someone. He's really one of the sweetest guys in college football in terms of um, media logistics. So he's not like a press person, but a person who handles like arrangements for the press. And he told me he was at one point associated with the Ivy League. One year, the Ivy League tried to do an in-person media day, and two people showed up. Two press people showed up because it was just no, none of their press wanted to actually drive to any one place. So they always do a conference call um, for that particular media day. So some of the suggestions for this were great. Like, can't we just use an empty conference room at the Washington State Vancouver campus and vancouver washington is actually just across the border from oregon it's not vancouver canada um somebody again and these are all coming from fans from wazoo and o o oregon state and oregon state fans said we should just skip the media thing and just go gamble the settlement money we'll either lose 100 percent or walk out with two thousand percent um so again the idea of them rebuilding the conference using gambling money is probably the best one um or at the very least, you know, I think they should just have like the hospitality suite, like because Big Twelve is having their media days in the uh, <laughs> in Las Vegas as well as the Mountain West, so they should have the uh, they should just simply have the uh, Pac-12 media hospitality suite. Um, so that way, the press always go there, like offer like a good you know, it's Vegas. There's good food at all these hotels. You know, maybe have a really pay a lot of money to have a very high end caterer, have a bunch of the press show up, and you know they're not very choosy folks. You know, we'll eat whatever. Um, you, you go into that, but I'm a, I'm a food guy, like connoisseur, like not because I'm fat, but I mean, because I actually know good food. Like when I was in Toronto, I did a couple of Michelin star restaurants and all that stuff. So like, the, but I know when I get in the media mode, my bar gets really low, like, Ooh, snack, snack mix, you know, you're like, wow, living like a king, <laughs> you know? So it doesn't take much to impress them. So all you have to do is just put some good food out at the same hotel. Actually, it's at Allegiant. Oh, and I don't know if they can afford it. Like uh, the big 12 is doing their media hotels at Bellagio. Like they went. They went she she on this like they they Brent your mark that's why they're looking the name at the all state conference they got to get money to to pay for all of this um this should just be the Bellagio conference that would actually be amazing um the Bellagio twelve the ocean ocean spray should do it it can be the oceans twelve and then they can hold it in Vegas that'll be even better you know I don't know Dr Pepper Bucko I see your hand up man rice owls rice crispy treats hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the Rice Krispies. Oh, my good. Like, that's what you're hoping. That's when we get into the logo badges on some of these uniforms. You want to see some fun stuff. I pointed out, again, like, obviously many, many different leagues do it. Obviously, the NBA has it, and a lot of, obviously, European soccer is basically, they don't even put their team names on them anymore. But um, it was interesting. I noticed a few years ago that college football teams in Japan started putting logos. And one of them, Waseda, uh, Waseda, pardon me, University, uh, they actually have a Mercedes logo because one of the dealerships in Tokyo sponsors them, and it looks actually surprisingly good. I showed I shared a tweet earlier today um, from one of those, uh, and you saw two of these player rival players in their uniforms, and you saw like they had the patches, and then I think each of them had one on the shoulder. But it was kind of a preview of where things could go. Um, certainly, there are some because again, when you think about it, if you sponsor uh, Michigan and Ohio, especially in Ohio State and Alabama, Georgia. You're going to get a lot of bang for your buck from that because you're going to see every photo of those players put out there is going to probably show the upper part of their body. Um, and you get that. I mean, that's the whole reason why Nike and Adidas started to force the team some, to include the swoosh and the and the, whatever the Adidas stripe thing is. So, yeah, why not? Um, you can have some real fun with it, though. It's fun to want, imagine. I, as, as we were talking last week, actually, with John, you're an old Dominion guy. 
I mean, let's get the Old Dominion Trucking Company to sponsor the team. And we have Old Dominion on Old Dominion. You know, there's some real fun there. Some fun to be had, um, particularly if you can get maybe even some some kind of. Well, no team's going to accept a jab. So let's be honest there. You're not going to get a team that's got a rival school name on it or something like that. Although that would be that would be the, the Ivy League does not accept money, but decides to sponsor teams like the Harvard Stanford logo. But I don't know. The, uh, just, I'm getting silly. It's getting late. But uh, let's see here. A couple of other interesting ones. Um, you know, I always like to note talking about all this money that's being raked in. Meanwhile, at the NAIA level, uh, Concordia, and I always have to specify which because there's like nine Concordias, Concordia of Ann Arbor, so in Michigan, is going to discontinue athletics, including football, after the end of this next season. So for all the haves, we're seeing these have-not programs slowly erode. That's always the, I know that um, Concordia campus in Michigan has been having a lot of financial issues. So, you know, but speaking of owls, and this kind of, this one goes back to Dr. Pepper Bucko. UTSA is having fun with some of their ticket packages, and I guess I have to look again closely at their schedule, but they are hosting what is called the Owl Pack Mini Plan. Um, this is literally how it's written. Somebody clip this. Who, like Owl, who are they? The Roadrunners face three opponents at home this season whose mascots are owls. This mini plan includes tickets to each of the three home games against Kennesaw State, Florida Atlantic, and Temple. So I guess they must be uh, on the road um, against Rice, but uh, so those are those are they're playing their owl team. So again, I thought that was a cute one. You always love when when teams come up with fun ideas. You know, some of the fans in the other conferences are wondering SEC Tiger package when. Um, that that's a that's a good one. Who maybe we'll see one of those. The other funny story. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to this. Maybe, but um, gosh, Colorado, you always generate headlines. So apparently. There was a rumor, and I'm going to put it as a rumor, that players were told there was a mandatory, <laughs> I'm just saying it sounds so stupid, a mandatory Little Wayne concert for all players. And that was, quote, the final straw for some Colorado football transfers, according to a source within the program. Uh, the quote is, the Wayne concert was a final straw for a few players who hit the transfer portal when Coach Prime told us we had to be there to sport Shador as a rapper, they were not happy at all. To be honest, it was nothing but a huge distraction, and Daddy Ball was being played. So the other thing is apparently Shador, I'm not sure if he was being like one of the uh, the warm-up uh, artists. I'm not sure there. but uh, So needless to say, uh, this is kind of taken on a bit of a, a – when you make that kind of an accusation, it ends up with replies. And I do believe the Sanders family – revels in this kind of stuff um revels pardon me in this kind of stuff so uh they denied the allegations um a couple of times this is uh, as somebody who is uh observing this noted in our rcfb comments this is the stupidest timeline um and it is but it's amusing stupid for some uh so again there's been a couple of people who have quoted this um some people are also relaying like their experiences i knew a guy in college who would always ask us to come to his rap battles it was uncomfortable but it would have been weirder if his dad kept asking us as well. Um, my goodness. Uh, I, I don't know where to even go with that. It's just, it's comedy. It's comedy, folks. This is the timeline we live in. So apparently Pat McAfee also remains unsigned with ESPN's college game day as the season nears. I'm not sure what's going on there. There's a weird dance going on. I don't know how much of this can be taken for you know contract negotiation tactics, but I know he's a polarizing figure. Um, be interesting to see where that one goes. I know Nick, Nick Saban, though. Let, let's let's set aside Pat for a second. Nick Saban's going to be joining game. Excuse me, game day. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see that. Um, I hope to see how they integrate him in. Hopefully, they'll find a way to. Corso's never going to leave that show. It's just the way he is. He likes being there. It's what gives him life. And I think I'll let him be there as long as he needs to. But I wonder if they can maybe come up with a way to to ease that balance with Saban coming in and also getting his feet wet. Um, but there's moments where, where the way course was handling it, that kind of reminds me of actually, this is a weird reference to make, but Pope John Paul II, because he also famously towards the end was like aging really badly and not and intentionally not taking certain medications because he wanted people to understand that this is part of the process. So it got really awkward there for that pontiff for a while. So now I'm watching course. I'm like, man, this is kind of reminding me of that a little bit. But again, I, I think he's earned that ability to be there. Um, and I'm really interested to see how, 
Saban gets worked into it as perhaps a co-coach up there. John, I see your hand yeah, up. Yeah, I was about to ask. So do we think he's going to get like an actual chair at the table? I mean, it's going to be a crowded table at this point because that's what, like five? It would be wi- it would be crowded, but it would be wild if they didn't. You know, it, it would be wild if they didn't. Oh, you know what? I just, by the way, I saw Barstool Fresno. I saw your two questions and I apologize. They were in the, they were in the replies and I didn't get a chance to, to, uh, to, well, first of all, the Coors Light Mountain West is perfect. I agree that that's a good one. Um, but the interesting question was thoughts on Fresno state at Michigan to start the season. And that is, that is, it, so okay, Fresno state, we we're doing our G five show. They are one of those teams where actually we put them as one of the potential like, it's funny, we structured it, and I'm, again, you don't have to go listen to the show, but the way we did the, we, and it's so funny, actually, the second episode hasn't even come out yet, we, were, we did two, two yesterday, but the first one we did, which is out right now on the College Football Survivor Show, is we looked at the nine teams from the G5, who we thought could be the contenders to be that 12th team. Um, they're originally, they were originally 10, but we removed Miami of Ohio at the last second, because uh, we decided, like, eh, two MAC teams, that's pushing it, we, we just had Toledo. As that particular team, but we had like, gosh, should we have two or three teams? Because we had Boise State, and we also had, uh, yeah, we had Fresno State as the two from the Mountain West who we thought were the most likely. And and the conversation about Fresno State actually surrounded how you can afford as a G five to drop a close game with a, another team uh, from the P with the P four and potentially get in again with Boise State. We're talking about that at Oregon game which is almost certainly going to be a loss for them, but they, you know, they, their schedule isn't too bad after that. But Fresno State is also in an interesting position. And Michigan, and that's, an, that's a, again, that's an August 31st game, so we're, that's going to be early on. That's a chance where I think the Bulldogs could surprise because Michigan is going to be, they're really talented. People really should not undersell the, the talent level at Michigan that, that is being left there for Sharon Moore. But it is a new season for them a, a lot of changes i mean they did really well at the nfl draft so that's a means reloading in a lot of places so the talent may be there but it may be a little bit shaky um we're still not entirely sure the quarterback situation um there are assumptions of where it's going to go but you're not going to have obviously somebody like jj mccarthy back there so a team like fresno state coming in with a top 15 uh returning production in terms of overall returning production they have obviously uh I believe it's Mikey Keene uh, as a quarterback returning. They've got a good running back with Malik Sherrod. Good receiver with Jalen. I'm looking at my notes from the last show. So Jalen Moss. Um, the defense was the weak spot. So I think that's a big question. They're kind of in the same boat as uh, LSU and all of this. Um, they're like the G5 LSU. We're trying to see, can they get that defense moving? So could they beat Michigan? It, certainly the chances are better this year than most, um, but we don't entirely know what to make of Fresno State. And the other thing with Fresno State, and this is where I was thinking, there is a bit of a side show, not show, but side conversation about the health of Jeff Tedford. Because obviously last season, I thought he was medically retiring, but it was apparently only for the bowl game. Um, so he comes back. Now he had left in 2019. Because of he medically retired, and this I think all goes back to the heart issues he had when he was an assistant at the Buccaneers. He had heart surgery in 2014, so he obviously stepped back in 2019. They hired a, a young kid named Kalen DeBoer, not young, but uh, who obviously did quite well there, and then moved on to uh, with a hop, skip, and a jump to Alabama. But the uh, the thing is, so he's back. I'm worried it's turning into it could, and again, I hope he's healthy. I hope there's no problems with him. I hope he, again, this is just a blip. But you think of Jerry Kill, and you see all the hiccups that obviously caused him to leave Minnesota and tragically leave New Mexico State. Like, that broke my heart, seeing him leaving New Mexico State, because that was a perfect pairing over there. Or you think of Joe Moglia at uh, Coastal Carolina. Phenomenal coach. Um, he is so rich, he didn't really need the job. I mean, for those who don't know, he was the CEO of, like, T- TD Ameritrade. Uh, engineered, like, I think he engineered the merger of TD, uh, of, of TD Ameritrade. Um, and so, like, he just wanted to be a coach, ended up being a great coach. But, like, I remember talking to him, and he's like, yeah, I just realized, you know what? My health just isn't working. And he had famously, like, right before a season, said he's not going to coach. So there was an interim coach with Jamie Chadwell, um, and then coached another season and then said, I can't do it anymore. I'm done. So I'm worried with Jeff Tedford. Is that what we're seeing? It could be, could not be. But... 
that that's the other side story when we talk about Fresno State that I'm I'm a little concerned about. But all that said, the offense is going to be ready to play. Unfortunately, the one part of Michigan that I don't have any problems with is the defense. They're also going to be ready to play. So we'll see how that goes. We'll see if that turns into um into an even Steven. But again, if they can keep it close, if Fresno State can keep it close at Michigan and win the rest of that schedule, which is not too bad. I mean, they have Wazoo at home. And of course, Wazoo and Oregon State are playing a lot of the Mountain West this season as part of their arrangement. They're playing at UCLA at the end of the season. If you know anything about the Valley, and I grew up in the Valley, I grew up in uh, the armpit of Bakersfield. But if you know anything about the Valley, the opportunity of Fresno State to go down and play USC or UCLA, you're going to see a lot of people show up, not just from the Valley. A lot of these people live in the LA Metro. So in LA is enormous people, It's 14 million people. There's a lot of people. So they, they can pack that stadium and it's UCLA. So I'm not even sure how many of their fans are going to be there. You know, if, if the season, Hey, you know, I, I'm excited for the season with Sean Foster, but it's still a, a new season and a lot of questions. They may not be that great by the end of the season. So the UCLA fans are already a little fickle, may not even be in the Rose Bowl, but I'm going to tell you what the Bulldogs fans are going to be. Um, and then I think their conference schedule isn't that bad either. I think one of the tougher games is going to Air Force. And Air Force, I believe they have three returning starters at like period. They were literally dealing with the, the rotation you get just with the armed services. But like it is a system. Air Force can reload pretty quick, but they're not. Uh, this is. Probably not going to be one of Troy Calhoun's strongest seasons there. But uh, all of that said, that was a good question. I'm glad we got to talk about that Fresno State at Michigan game. I think if they can get through that with a close one, they're going to be one of those G5 contenders for sure. Um, pending, obviously, where it goes in the Mountain West Championship game should also be a good one as well, uh, especially if it ends up being like Boise State versus Fresno State. That would be an exciting one. That would be one I, would, I think will be a, a must-see uh, of the conference championship games. Um, another interesting story, but just because I want to hit on a couple of more before we kind of slowly wrap this up. Les Miles, this is again, this is from the last week. Les Miles is suing LSU over vacated wins. Why would he be suing his alma mater? Well, not alma mater, pardon me, but the, the, the school where he won a national championship and was pushed out um, because he didn't want to ever change some of his coaching style. It The games that were vacated are keeping him below the threshold of win percentage you need to qualify for the Hall of Fame. Um, the Hall of Fame has some, because they vacated 37 wins, and by it renders him ineligible for the College Football Hall of Fame. So he's literally suing the school because he wants to, to climb back in. Because of that, by the way, his record, and this is actually fantastic, for those who don't know, the officially recognized record, when you subtract those 37 wins is 108 and 73, which puts him at a winning percentage of 0.9, pardon me, 0 0.597, 0.597. The threshold is 0.6. So he literally is like three games now from, uh, from qualify. And I mean, this is just a bigger problem. I mean, Les Miles, it's easy to talk about him, but you know, there's some major coaches. Now, Mike Leach is, I think, the fashionable one to talk about only because obviously he passed recently, and there's no reason not to deny it. He also has a 0.596 record, but there's some other big names like Howard Schnellenberger. Howard Schnellenberger, like he is one of the greatest coaches of all time. I mean, he turned a team that was about to be cut at Miami into what people think of when they think of successful Miami. Like he built that program. Um, he did some good, he coached fairly well at Louisville. They love him there because he was also one of the guys that kind of kept them going there as well. Oklahoma, not so much. We won't talk about that, that one season at Oklahoma. Um, FAU, he built that program from the ground up. He got them to their, he, from literally year one to their first bowl game. One of the best photos is an image uh, from college football is Howard Schellenberger, who used to love wearing suits, for FAU, he stopped wearing suits as much, but watching him get Gatorade bath, and if you ever looked what he looks like, like just looking at his face, he looked like a really angry cat being thrown into a bathtub. Like that, that is just an indelible image. Um, so, and another one, uh, gosh, Georgia Southern's great coach from before, again, before they were an FBS team, um, uh, Eck. Oh, I forgot his name. Uh, his first name's Eck, it, it, but it's short for something. But again, tremendous coach won national championships at Georgia Southern. He didn't coach enough. Uh, he actually stepped back uh, to be, and Paul Johnson took over for him. 
and he doesn't qualify for the College Football Hall of Fame. So there's cool. and and by the way, that rule is fairly recent because, uh, as I believe it was a uh, Bruce Feldman, I was listening to him talk about this. There's quite a few coaches in the Hall of Fame who are actually below that threshold, but it was before they added that rule or that minimum number of wins. John, your hands up. Yeah, do you think uh, Les uh, should just sue to have three games back then? So he <laughs> hit a sixty percent. Maybe maybe negotiate a deal. Say, hey, I don't want all thirty something wins back. Just give me like five, and we'll just talk. We'll talk. <laughs> yeah, that that would be the settlement. We'll, we'll add three, and then watch the because like, what's the NCA going to get involved at that point? Like, are they going to try and overturn the win if if it was voluntarily overturned by? Uh, uh, I don't know. That that would be funny. Like, what will it take to just get me to six? To the exact point six. Just just give that to me. My goodness, I need six. It's like a movie. By the way, I just want to also. I want to also credit Michael Connolly. He, he threw something in the in the replies as well. This is going back to corporate naming of conferences. The Goldman Sachs SEC. That I think if the SEC or Big Ten agree to get named, it's going to be some huge. Yeah, it's going to be like again, like we think of Barclays Premier League. It's going to be something we we don't even like that mo- normal people don't even deal with. Like it's just a messaging to like the billionaire alumni of those teams who might need like a personal financial manager or something. Um, <laughs> it is, it is fun to imagine that. Oh my goodness. Um, let me see here as, you know, by the way, we're talking about rice just a little bit. And, uh, one of the things, I don't know if this story is going to go anywhere, but, uh, rice apparently considering building a new stadium, which I'm not sure that's a, a wise decision for rice. So, so, okay. Rice is one of the smallest college football supporting FBS college football schools. I walked the campus finally when I went to cover the national championship. I figured, okay, I'm in, you know, I got an extra day. I'd like to walk the rice campus. It's not big because it's a small student body. It's, I believe hovering around 5,000 altogether. Um, they have a good architecture school. They've got good stuff. Like they go to, well, here's the funny thing. So the, the campus isn't big. It's not tall. It's very flat. You walk through it, before you get to the stadium, which is on one end of the bit, you see a brand new multi-million dollar facility. It's not for sports. They built a like high-end opera house. That is what their alumni build on their campus. Like this opera house, I'm not joking. I walked and I looked at this thing. I'm like, this is like, spect-. and I looked up pictures online of what it looks like inside. They spent, I believe, many, many millions of dollars on this thing. And then you get to Rice Stadium, which is just, like across the parking lot. It's a big parking lot, but across the parking lot, you can just walk in. It's one of those types of stadiums. And I'd known they'd reduce the capacity. Like if you go on one end, you could see where the seats had been. They've been ripped out. It's just concrete tiers. But then I made it back to the, uh, the can, like the, the regular deck. And then you realize like this has not been updated in probably decades. There are concession like, like tables but like no, no fancy stands at all. It, knowing what I know about Texas high school football, I'm certain there are better Texas high school football uh, stadiums than there are at Rice Stadium. All of that said, the bones of that stadium are really good. There's a lot of empty space in the way that the upper deck kind of puts over the lower deck. So you could easily just update that stadium and probably save a ton of money. So the idea that they might think of rebuilding a new stadium, not sure I'm a fan of that, Rice. Keep Rice Stadium. I mean... You guys have hosted so many things there. Many great teams have gone and played Rice in that stadium. Um, you know, it, some people had a little bit of fun of that because, again, uh, some, you know, making uh, JFK references because, of course, that was where Kennedy gave the uh, we do these things not because they are easy but because they are hard, you know, talking about the Apollo project. But at the same time, he said, why does Rice play Texas? Um, so, again, some people thought, like, you know, you should – Keep the stadium, or some people said you should build a new one, not because it's easy, but because it is hard. My goodness, we're getting late here. Um, let us slowly start wrapping this up. You know, one thing I am going to mention, only because it came up a bit in the news. So there was a House Committee on Education and the Workforce. They had a bill that actually made it out of committee. Like, I want to just say this, and I'll say it again. The, 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 well, this particular flavor of bill is about exempting college athletics from being deemed employees. This is the the Hail Mary that the NCAA really wants. And when the NCAA wants it, they're speaking on behalf of college football teams, not just, or not college football, but all college teams. And remember, they're not just speaking on behalf of the FBS. They're speaking on behalf of Division II, Division Three. There's over a thousand universities that are part of the NCAA. It's those schools that are worried that if this comes forward, this could be a life or death for our literally our entire academic 
Well, for some of those schools, they add sports because they don't pay for scholarships and athletics. And those are tuition paying students who want to still play a sport. So those are the ones that are like, this could not only kill our athletic department, this could potentially kill our school. Um, all of that said, there might be a way around it and all of that said. But uh, this particular bill is trying to exempt college athletes from being deemed employees. It's a big, people are making a big fuss over it because it made it out of committee. Most of the other bills, and there have been many bills in the last several years, have not gone anywhere because there's no political capital for it. I don't think this is going anywhere. Because, first of all, I doubt it'll actually be brought to the House floor. Because Not because people are against it, but because there's, there's, it's not, it's not uh, sexy enough. It, it's an election year. There's so many other topics. And, and the fact is, they'll probably try and attach it to something else. It probably won't stand on its own. Um, and if it does, it gets sent to the Senate. And the Senate's going to be like, well, why are you sending this, this bill? I, I'm just cautioning that we're, even though there was a little more conversation than normal about this bill making it out of that House committee, I'd be surprised that it, if it goes further than that. There's been a lot of folks who are very savvy about this, who've been writing great papers early on that all this stuff probably isn't going to go anywhere. Um, so I'm just cautioning that because I've been trying to be uh, throwing, some, um, throwing some ice on some of these, these conversations. And uh, meanwhile... One last thought. Apparently, Texas, their SEC celebration on June 30th is going to be headlined by Mr. Worldwide, uh, Pitbull, um, much to the chagrin of some of the folks at Texas who thought that was um, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the Texas fans, uh, Wild One. He said, uh, oh, you better get an even more washed up rapper for this celebration. Um, some of the other fans have suggested that perhaps Vanilla, Vanilla Ice will headline um, Oklahoma's announcement. But. Again, we love college football. We love the silliness. Whenever people say this is so stupid, I kind of I love it. I mean, that's what it is. This isn't these are college students. I mean, yeah, they're less and less. They feel like it every day because of all the funds. But I mean, it's really above the table. We saw that, every, you know, if they want to drive a fun car, let them drive a fun car. As long as the teams are still playing, I'll probably keep following them. But I'm going to just go ahead and wrap this up. We've been going for a little over an hour. Um, my name is Bob Ekairi. This is RCFB Talk 197. We do these every Tuesday night. It's an opportunity just to hear whatever you all want to talk about. We try to stay, I try to stay up and up on what's going on. Um, if you like my voice, want to hear another particular podcast, uh, Advanced Media Group does the College Football Survivor Show. Uh, it's a more formal podcast. I do that with Shahan J. Raja of CBS Sports. We sometimes have guests. We mostly try and figure out who the playoff contenders are going to be. Um, it's been more exciting now that there's 12 teams in it. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you to all of you who joined us. Thank you to all of you who listened. Um, again, RCFB Talk 197. If you, if you miss the beginning, this will turn into a recording. I'll try and get this up wherever you get your podcasts uh, as part of the RCF, RCFB Talk series. So I'll, I'm going to hang up and listen. Take care.